Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wednesday seminar for the 9th of September. Um, just the usual reminders from me to please um, send us plenty of welcome, uh, plenty of comments and questions, but via the chat line, please. Um, we will have a survey that's posted at the top of the chat line too, if you have a moment during or after the seminar. We welcome your feedback on that. So I'll pass over now to David Robinson, the chair of today's seminar. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everybody. For those that don't know me already, my name is David Robinson, and I'm the branch head for the Basin Systems branch. I'd like to begin today by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal people. The Ngunnawal people have been meeting on these lands for tens of thousands of years. And that's a tradition that we uh, continue today. So it's a, a great honour to do that. And I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today from wherever they are. Today, we'll hear a, a presentation from Dr. Anand Ray and Chris Harris Pascal. Uh, they're going to talk about a, a new innovative technique that's been developed at Geoscience Australia to try to understand groundwater salinity from AEM and borehole data. Anand he is a statistically minded geophysicist who has worked in industry, academia, and government. His main interests are in using mathematics to improve existing scientific techniques that feed into natural resource management and conservation. Chris joined GA as a graduate in 2013 and began working with us as a hydrogeologist in the groundwater branch in 2014. He is currently now in the Groundwater Geoscience Directorate of the Basin Systems Branch. In 2012, Chris completed an honours thesis titled Uranium Isotope Geochemistry of Groundwater in the Riverine Plain, New South Wales, Applications for Understanding Recharge and Residence Times. And he has maintained an interest in how science can be used to inform the management of water resources ever since. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Anand and Chris to deliver their presentation. Thanks, David. Um, sorry, just getting the slides up and the video off. Um, as David said, we're going to be presenting uh, a technique that has been developed for understanding the distribution of groundwater salinity uh, using airborne electromagnetic data. So just to give a bit of a structure for the talk, I'm going to start uh, with some information about salinity as an issue. Uh, and how widespread it is in Australia. Then Anand will give some background about airborne electromagnetics as a technique, uh, what we do with the data and how it can be used. And then we'll go through a case study uh, from the Keep River Plains, uh, which was one of the projects uh, in our first phase of the Exploring for the Future program. Uh, and we've got two different approaches there uh, to talk through and um, Hopefully we'll show a bit of a progression in, in the way we use this technique. And then we've got some suggestions for further work going into the future. And hopefully after all that, we'll have time for questions if anybody has any. Uh, and I guess I should say this technique we're about to present is really the, the most recent step on a journey that has been continuous through many projects that GA, GA has undertaken looking at groundwater and how AEM can be used to inform our understanding of it over the last decade, maybe even more. Um, but it's before my time. You go back more than 10 years. Um, so before we go any further, uh, I feel it's worth talking about some definitions. Salinity is uh, the presence of salt in the landscape, and that can be a natural occurrence, uh, a good example of that 
are the salt lakes that occur in central Australia where groundwater discharges and evaporates and what is left behind is a crust of salt. That's usually termed primary salinity. The type of salinity that we're usually concerned about in terms of land management is secondary salinity, uh, which is where some hydrologic change or land use change has led to uh, the mobilization of salt to an area that it wasn't used, used wasn't present previously. Uh, and the two most important uh, forms of that are dry land salinity or irrigation salinity. To describe those a little bit better, uh, dry land salinity, this is sort of a before and after image showing the development of dry land salinity. On the left, we have a system uh, with deep rooted vegetation uh, and they have a, a large water requirement. So when it rains, very little of the water that enters the soil profile will actually percolate all the way down to the water table which means that the water table is relatively deep. Uh, and if that vegetation is removed, we go to the image on the right, a much larger fraction of the rain that falls on the land surface will percolate through the soil profile and down to the water table, which we term recharge. Um, that increased recharge will cause the water table to rise. Unfortunately, in Australia, the water table is quite saline in a lot of areas. Uh, which means that the rising water table is bringing with it a lot of salt. And that can cause issues uh, in, in one sense that if the water table rises to the root zone of vegetation, then that causes problems for the vegetation. Uh, but if it rises to intersect the land surface, which is what is happening in this cartoon where it says, where it's got that label of discharge site, um, water will discharge at the surface and in arid or semi-arid areas it evaporates leaving behind the salt and that salt that precipitates out disrupts the structure of the soil and allows it to be winnowed away by the wind and that forms salt skulls which uh, if anyone listening has ever been down to the south coast then Next time you go there, on your way back, keep an eye out for salt skulls. There are some great ones you can see on the hillsides between Braidwood and Bungendore. Um, irrigation salinity is a very similar process, but uh, slightly more local, and it, it doesn't need to be associated with land clearing or, or changes in vegetation. Um, where water is applied to an irrigated field, uh, if the crops don't use all of the water that is applied to the land surface. Obviously, there's some excess water that's going to percolate through the soil profile and that will enter the water table, again, increasing the recharge, causing the water table to rise. Uh, and in furrow irrigation systems where the water is delivered to crops with uh, irrigation channels, then the base of those channels can leak. Uh, so uh, that again, increases the recharge of water to the water table, causing it to rise. And that can cause problems in two ways. If the uh, water table contains saline water or if the unsaturated part of the soil profile contains salt, then the rising water table will mobilize that salt and can bring it up into the root zone of the crops, which is uh, bad for the crops. Um, it can also cause water logging issues uh, if the crop roots remain saturated constantly. Most, most plants don't actually like that situation. Um, so issues with salinity, why do we care? Um, just a handful of impacts. Um, obviously there's reduced crop yield or in extreme cases, land can become so sal salinized that agricultural production becomes impossible. Um, if water is being used for livestock, Again, obviously, if the water is too saline, then that, that reduces the condition of the livestock. Um, but it can also increase the salt load in surface water. Uh, in particularly uh, dry land salinity, um, you've got two, two ways for salt to enter the surface water. In those salt skulls where salt is precipitating, when it rains, that salt is carried into the surface water system by runoff. But as well as that, when the water table rises, if the water table is in connection with 
uh, surface water bodies, then the rising water table will increase the amount of groundwater discharge to the surface water. So uh, you can get significant increases in salt load through both dry land salinity processes and irrigation salinity if the rising water table is increasing that uh, degree of connection between the groundwater and surface water. Coming with that, there's a loss of biodiversity, both aquatic in aquatic ecosystems if the surface water salt load is increased, but also terrestrial ecosystems if saline water rises to the level of the root zone of vegetation. Uh, as I described with the salt skull development, it increases the rate of erosion uh, and it also increases the risk of flooding in an area because if the water table is very close to the surface, then the soil has no capacity to absorb more water when it rains. So in very heavy rain events, um, rather than that water going into the ground, it becomes runoff and that can cause flooding. So to give some statistics about salinity in Australia, uh, these data come from a, a Bureau of Statistics survey in 2002, uh, where there was some supplementary questions to the Australian Agricultural Census, specifically to do with the presence of salinity on farms. Um, unfortunately, and, and there's been a lot of work focused on salinity since this time, but um, we are unable to compare these data with anything more recent because it, it seems like the questions haven't been asked since that 2002 exercise. So um, I know it's a bit old, but these are the most up-to-date values we've got. So in 2002, they found 14% of all farms in Australia showed signs of salinity and the land area associated with that was almost 2 million hectares. Um, of that, 800,000 hectares were too salinized for agricultural use. And to put that in perspective, the current total irrigated land area in the Murray-Darling Basin is 1.6 million hectares. So we're talking about half of the irrigated land in the Murray Basin becoming unusable for agriculture as a result of salinity. Uh, as an interesting side note, there seemed to be a relationship in the data between the size of farms and the prevalence of salinity or the frequency with which salinity was observed. Um, so 8% of holdings less than 500 hectares showed signs of salinity, while almost 20% of farms greater than 500 hectares showed signs of salinity. And there was some suggestion that might be to do with the capacity of uh, land managers to implement different management strategies to manage salinity, uh, which is obviously much harder on a very large scale. Um, and, and that probably accounts for the fact that it's only 14% of farms, but the actual land area that is affected is very large. Uh, and this was done, I think, as part of the National Land and Water Resources Audit, which started in 2001. And while this, this ABS survey assessed or dealt with the uh, observation of salinity that was already occurring on agricultural land, uh, this land and water resources audit also looked at areas that were, that were at risk of developing secondary salinity based on the depth to the water table in different parts of Australia. Uh, and they identified five, about five and a half million hectares that were at risk of developing secondary salinity. So salinity is not a problem there yet, but it was deemed that there was a, a reasonable risk of it occurring in those areas. So there was a national action plan uh, for salinity and water quality, um, which was endorsed, I think, by all the state and territory governments and the Commonwealth government. Uh, and that identified a number of priority regions for salinity management and prevention of developing secondary salinity. Uh, so here's a map of the areas that are identified. And when we get into talking about our case study, it's going to be in this polygon up on the Northern Territory, Western Australia border, uh, which is the Ord River irrigation area. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, one of the tools that was uh, identified as, as a, a promising way to understand this problem in the National Action Plan 
was using airborne electromagnetics to better understand the distribution of salinity in the Australian landscape. So to tell you a little bit about AEM and how that works, I'm going to hand over now to Anand. Uh, thanks, Chris. I'll just turn my screen share on and let's see how that works. You're going to get something funky and then now you should be able to see my screen and we should be able to get to the right slide, which is that one. Uh, can someone say if they are seeing pictures of aeroplanes on my screen? Looking good. Uh, thank you, Chris. So um, thank you for that excellent introduction to the scale of the of the issue and uh, its its historical um, uh, precedence uh, to be able to address this issue uh, as as Chris has mentioned we um, uh, have been using airborne electromagnetics to first assess it and in doing so um, uh, this has been a joint work between the groundwater and the minerals folks at geoscience Australia so um, uh, it, I think it is appropriate that we name Neil Symington, uh, Yusenle Cooper, Ross C. Brody, and KP10 as some of the others who've contributed to this work that uh, Chris and I are presenting. It's really a, a very um, uh, a complex um, piece of work with, with many moving parts that we've hopefully simplified for your understanding, but it wouldn't have been possible without the expertise that everybody has contributed. Um, so one of the reasons um, why airborne electromagnetics is used is because of the scale of the problem. So um, as Chris's map showed, um, you know, th 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 there's a huge part of Australia that is potentially impacted. And um, if we were to try and sample the soil using either drilling or, um, you know, using uh, chemical samples from various places and then went from place to place on the ground, it would be an extremely slow process. On the other hand, if we used aircraft, which move at the slowest at around hundreds of kilometers per hour to a few hundred uh, kilometers per hour, then you could potentially cover a large part of um, uh, the surveying in, in a reasonable time frame, which makes it possible to assess and then do something about the impacted areas. But first we have to assess it. So to do that, uh, these instruments, uh, these these aircraft carry instruments which pulse the earth, and these aircraft could either be fixed-wing planes or helicopters. And um, how they do it is in the following fashion: so they pulse the earth with an electromagnetic field, and the earth responds, um, and it sends back a secondary field, and that is picked up by antennae on the aircraft. And um, the response depends on the underlying geology, as you can see over here. So there's some granite gneisses, and then there's some other kinds of um, lithology in between, and there's these sediments on top. And to give you an idea of the scale of things, uh, there's a, a, a drill hole with what's known as an induction logger. So that's an instrument which you can put down into the earth to be able to measure the uh, conductivity of the earth, the, the electromagnetic conductivity. And um, there's a little truck which helps you get around from place to place. And um, here's your um, aircraft, which is above that. And it, it tells you something about the speed with which you can um, assess the same area and also the amount of, of area that you can assess with an aircraft. So this is why airborne electromagnetics is, is particularly suited to um, uh, mapping the issue at hand. Um, so the, in, in most of this talk, what we're going to try to tell you is if we have co-located measurements like this, if we have a place where we have actually drilled the earth and we've found out something in, in great detail, because look at the size of that drill hole and look at the size of the footprint of uh, the measurement, which is very small, and look at the size of the airborne electromagnetic footprint, which is much larger. That's the larger ellipse over there. So if we have co-located measurements, then we can use information from one to inform the other at places where we don't have drill holes. So airborne electromagnetics can tell us about what's going on in the landscape, but to add to the detail that we don't know, we can use these co-located measurements where both are known. And uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, in some detail about that. And um, so how AEM works is it, 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 it first, you, you first have to lay out a survey and these quiggly lines that you see in figure A are essentially how uh, 
an aircraft is going to fly uh, from location to location. And if we zoom in on this one location over there, um, we call that a sounding, and various soundings make up a line. And at that sounding, when we pulse the Earth, the Earth responds, and that's what you see in figure B. So on the y-axis, that's what I'm pointing at right now, there's the electromagnetic field. In this case, it's the magnetic field, it would seem like. And on the y on the x-axis, there's time. So you've pulsed the Earth, and the Earth responds. And then, <clears throat> you know, it's like an echo. When, when with, with time, the echo decreases. And that's kind of what you see. It's an electromagnetic echo that's decreasing with time. And we have to do a bunch of mathematics. And this is where um, I specialize a little bit in, in the statistical interpretation of these things. It's known as an inverse problem. So you invert this sounding into what is interpretable by geologists, which is known as a conductivity. So um, it's an electromagnetic conductivity. Um, so this conductivity uh, it has to be then assessed at various places. So if we go from figure C to figure D, we can color various parts of the Earth in terms of conductivity, such that red means more conducting and blue means more resistive. So what we've done is we've placed an air aircraft over the Earth, we then sound the Earth, we then convert that sounding into conductivity, conductivity at various places, and then we do it at all places along the Earth and we make these beautiful colorful maps. Um, now, conductivity is useful, but it needs to be translated into something which is um, geologically sensible. So what we're after in this case is saline water, and that's on the red end of the spectrum because red is bad and blue is good. Because um, as you all know, if you go to the sea, uh, salt water is salty, whereas if you go to a lake, then, well, hopefully uh, it isn't salty. And that's uh, uh, because it's not conducting and it's resistive and it would appear on the blue side. So red is um, bad and blue is good. Now, to make sense of conductivity, which is just a number, you have to go to regional experts like um, Chris or, or KP10, who's one of the co-authors of our, our paper, because they will translate what these numbers mean into a geological context. Is it salt water? Is it brackish water? Is it something that's shaly and silty? Or is it an igneous rock? And so it's all about context. And to interpret it, you really need a team of people. And that's what we do well at Geoscience Australia. Um, further, when an aircraft is flying over land, this is what you see. There's a lot of nothing out there. And that's why Australia is so beautiful, but it's also why it's very hard to assess because you have to see through the cover. And when you uncover the Earth, this is what you see. These are images of conductivity within the Earth. And um, this, again, is a section of what has occurred when the airplane has flown along a flight line. And then we've done this process of mathematical inversion, where we convert the sounding into an image that is interpretable by geologists, which we will then pass on to the pastoralists or other land use uh, and water use managers who will then decide what to do with um, uh, you know, the information they have at hand. And it's a multi-purpose tool which can be used for minerals as well. Uh, so here's what a geologist would make of that electromagnetic section in terms of conductivity. Because let's face it, as in conductivity is useful, but it needs to come into a context such as, oh, that's a saline intrusion, oh, or that's a, a sediment fill, or that's a valley fill, uh, that's just alluvium over there. And um, so then geologists can make these detailed interpretations based on field work that they've done in the area, on their knowledge of uh, geology that's exposed to the surface, and they'll come up with an interpretation like you see on the top. And in this case, they've actually been able to divide it into two domains, A and B, which seem to be separated by a fault at about 12 kilometers along the line, which is where I'm pointing. Um, and now I'm going to hand it back to Chris for uh, a further explanation of what you can do with airborne electromagnetic data. Thanks, and then sorry, just struggling to get my slides back up. It is a, a, a little uh, confusing, I think, the first time we do it, especially with all these puzzling effects to do with uh, screens, mirroring screens, mirroring screens. <laughs> Did 
There they are. I can see them. Wonderful. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so moving on to our case study, this is the Keep River Plains in the Northern Territory, and it's within that Ord River irrigation area that was identified in the National Action Plan as a, an area that might be vulnerable to the development of secondary salinity. Uh, in the map on the left, these two pink blobs are the Ord Stage 3 zones that I guess since the beginning of the Ord irrigation scheme, these have been identified as areas that might be developed for irrigation in sub subsequent phases. Uh, in the sort of southwestern corner of that image, you can see the current or stage one irrigation area. And south of that is Kununurra, which is the largest town in the area in Western Australia. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with the Department of Environment and Natural, Resource, uh, Natural Resources in the Northern Territory. What we wanted to look at in this area was uh, what the distribution of groundwater salinity was across the Keep River Plains so that the department in the NT could make an assessment of, I guess, a, a more informed assessment of what the potential hazard in developing uh, salinity might be if irrigation was to go ahead. So there has been a reasonable amount of work in the area in the past to try and orient everybody uh, on this map on the left, we've still got the NTWA border marked and the two pink polygons I showed you before are sort of through this area uh, where the, to, up to the bright red in the northeast uh, and also including this yellowy patch in the south. Um, and the map, on, so that map on the left is the airborne electromagnetic conductance that was uh, came from a survey flown, I think, in the 90s. Uh, and they're presenting um, the conductivity as a, as a single value across the whole area. So they've basically integrated across the entire depth that the AEM signal uh, has seen. They're averaging that into a single conductance value. Um, Whereas I guess what, what we have been trying to do at GA is to break that up into uh, different conductivities at different depths, which was reflected in some of the cross sections and NAND was just showing. The map on the right is a groundwater salinity map made from uh, borehole data in the area. So they've just taken uh, measurements at boreholes and interpolated in between them to, to create a map. And that's got uh, some of the features that are usually associated with interpolations like these spotty patches or, or bullseyes, some people call them. So that's probably a single bore with a very high measurement that is uh, affecting the resulting map, maybe in a, um, un, or having an, an unduly large effect on the resulting map. Uh, but the important thing to draw your attention to here is that the conductivity shown by the AEM is not always correlated with high salinity in the groundwater. So if you look at this area in the west, uh, that's all blue. So we've got low conductivity, but the groundwater through that area has been measured as very saline. Uh, and on the NT side of the border, we've got relatively fresh groundwater through uh, some of this area marked as the Weaver Plain, but the AEM conductivity is actually relatively high. So uh, what we wanted to look at further is, is whether we can sort of push the AEM to give us a, a better understanding of when is that conductivity associated with groundwater salinity and when is it associated with something else, such as conductive geological units like shales. Uh, it's just a source for the image. So the way we did that was to try and collect more data about the both the lithology and the pore fluid or the groundwater uh, salinity in the area. And we did that with a sonic drilling campaign. So this thing you can see in the image now is the sonic drill rig. Um, there's the drilling head there and the mast and a whole lot of uh, rods here stacked up. 
Um, and sonic drilling is a very neat technique because it allows almost complete recovery of um, the material that you're drilling through. Many other drilling techniques like mud rotary or air rotary, which are more commonly used for putting in groundwater monitoring bores, uh, you're only able to recover a very small fraction of the material that you're drilling through and you're not allowed to, to recover it as intact core that you can then take samples from to do further work. Uh, pro probably the most important aspect of sonic drilling is that it doesn't use any drilling fluid uh, to help uh, with the drilling process. It just uses sonic vibrations to push the uh, drill bit into the earth, which means that we can recover the sediments we're drilling through without disturbing the composition of the groundwater that's held in them. So the material that we return with the sonic drilling looks like this. Uh, it's sort of extruded from the core barrel uh, into these big plastic bags to make sausages of sediment. Uh, and we had a a field lab set up in Kununurra, and I should acknowledge here the enormous uh, effort that the GIA lab staff made uh, to process all of this core for us and to, to take the subsamples and measure the pore fluid EC. Uh, without their work, this none of this would have been possible. Um, so what they did was to take subsamples, each of those little cardboard squares is marking where a sample was taken. Uh, then the sediment was pressed in a hydraulic press and the fluid filtered through a filter uh, to extract just the, the pore fluid that had been held in that sediment before we pulled it out of the ground. Uh, and then we used a, a probe just to measure what the electrical conductivity of that pore fluid was. So we got a very rich data set uh, that allowed us to see what the distribution of uh, pore fluid salinities was both in depth and laterally where we had you know a good distribution of boreholes and importantly you can see here on the bottom right which is the top of this piece of drill core uh, there are some very large um, pebble sized clasts so that's a, a fairly gravelly piece of core below that it becomes much sandier so uh, by having all of this intact core, we were able to sample all of the different lithologies that were present and get pore fluid samples from each of those, which allowed us to get a, a feeling for uh, whether the, how the pore fluid, what the pore fluid conductivity was among different lithologies. So it, it might have one conductivity when it's hosted in a sand. Um, but then if you've got a very clay rich interval, that clay might be conductive in the AEM, but we're now able to determine whether the pore fluid in that clay is also conductive and saline or whether it's actually fresh, which feeds into the way that we're gonna interpret the AEM later on. Uh, and so this, this graph is just to show um, the type of data we were able to get from the sonic core, uh, that's depth along the X axis and the measured EC of the pore fluids, and you can see it's it's relatively variable uh, with depth as you go through the drill core. So to connect the EC of the pore fluids with the AEM, uh, and this this is work that Neil Symington mostly did. Uh, he built a, a relationship between the uh, bulk conductivity we could see in the AEM uh, and the EC that was measured in the pore fluids. Um, and we just put a, a linear regression through that to come up with a, uh, a relationship between the EC measured in the AEM, sorry, the bulk conductivity measured in the AEM and what we would expect the EC of pore fluid to be in an area where we weren't able to sample it, so where we didn't have a drill core. So the equation for that line is above the graph there. And from that EC value, uh, we just converted it to total dissolved solids because I find that a preferable unit to deal with, um, with this function. And that uh, 1.41 value is just an average of the, uh, the relationship we found between where we had measured the EC of a groundwater sample uh, and measured the total dissolved solids. 
Um, so that's just a conversion factor. Once we'd built that relationship between the bulk conductivity and the pore fluid EC, we could estimate what the groundwater salinity might be at any point where we had AEM data, even if we had no borehole data. So we were able to produce a, uh, an estimated map of groundwater salinity across the area. But um, I'm going to talk now about trying to validate that map because we, uh, we used all our pore fluid data to build that empirical relationship between the AEM conductivity and the groundwater salinity. Um, we then wanted something to compare that to, to see how well our estimates had performed. So uh, we also took groundwater samples from those bores we drilled with the sonic drilling after they were completed. So this is a, a different data set from the pore fluid samples. We actually went to the bores after they were finished, put a pump down, pumped water from a, a specific depth and then could measure the salinity of those samples. So I, I realize I'm showing you a lot of uh, a lot of straight lines on an XY plot here, but this is a different straight line to the last one I just showed. Um, on the X axis here, we've got groundwater salinity that was observed in a groundwater sample taken from a monitoring bore. On the Y axis is the salinity that we predicted using that linear regression I just described. Uh, and it's important to point out here that the scale we are dealing with is three orders of magnitude. So we've got you know 100 down here on the on the low salinity end, but we get up to many tens of thousands of milligrams per liter of total dissolved solids in these area. So in log log space, it looks really good. Um, but if you look at it linearly, obviously there's still a strong relationship. Uh, and I think this, this method performed really quite well. But we have got an uncertainty on some of these estimates or the, the error between our observations and the um, prediction is a factor of two in some cases. So uh, that's, that's large enough to be quite meaningful in, in terms of what management decisions people might want to make. So... I guess we, we felt it was important to try and understand that uncertainty a little better and to try and uh, find a way to, because with, with this method, we were only able to provide at each point in space a single estimate of uh, what the salinity was in that area. And if the error bars are you know plus or minus 10,000, then um, that affects how you might use that information. So. Uh, the next thing that Anand is going to talk about is um, sort of further progressing this approach to come up with a, a method that allowed us to give a, a good sense of how uncertain our predictions were when we built these maps of groundwater salinity. So I'll hand back over to Anand. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, that was an excellent description of things as usual. And now, since we're both showing the same slide, I'm not sure which screen it is. Ah, yes, there we are. Uh, share. And you should now, uh, can you see my screen, Chris? Yes. OK, thank you. So um, on that excellent note, I will go to full screen mode. And um, you should still be able to see my screen. And here we are, coming back to you sound the earth, you get a sounding, convert that into a conductivity, and then make you know beautiful pictures of what the geology might look like. Except, as Chris pointed out, it's not always that simple. At any location in the earth, in addition to the red and green models of conductivity in the earth, that's conductivity on the x-axis, on the y-axis, there's depth. You see all these blue lines appearing, which are other models of conductivity with depth, which at that particular sounding location, and this is actually from real data in the East Kimberley area, um, these other blue models can also satisfy uh, a particular sounding. However, where blue models cluster, you're likely to be a lot more certain. So what this is telling you is that your blue models are saying that um, conductivity in the earth, you start off from a certain value, it decreases, then it goes back high again. There's probably an interface somewhere in there. And then it remains more or less constant between 25 to 100 meters depth. And then the uncertainties begin to balloon. 
So we need to keep these uncertainties in mind because we're making decisions under uncertainty. And so we need to quantify how we've made the decisions on the basis of uncertainty. So to do that, the first thing we needed was to know where the saturated zone lie. And to do that, we had these wells, which were logged, there's 13 of them, that are these triangles. And that's where Chris and team and the you know uh, people in the local labs that they set up were able to do their uh, pore fluid estimations. And um, doing their pore fluid estimations, they also logged the water levels at each bore. And uh, using the water levels, the standing water levels they're known as at those bores, uh, Neil Symington made this beautiful map uh, of what the water table might look like. And there's not a whole lot of relief. Look at that. It's, it's only between 12 and 2 meters. So it's about 10 meters of relief. And over a large area, that's 10 kilometers on the scale there. And that's not surprising, right? Because you've got uh, Sandy Creek and the Keep River estuary over there. You're near sea level. And we don't have any massive cliffs like you do have on the south coast or anything over there. So it's largely flat, the water table, because it you know, follows the topography. Now, Underneath that water table is a saturated zone, and I think it was up to 50 meters depth underneath uh, that saturated uh, underneath that water table that we have multiple um, realizations of conductivity because there's that uncertainty which we get from the airborne electromagnetics. So there's multiple conductivity locations at every sounding. Um, which we are able to assess using some of the uh, software that's been developed in-house at Geoscience Australia by Ross C. Brody and um, Yusen Le Cooper in the mineral section. So we use that uh, for, we, we, we repurpose that for groundwater purposes, as you see over here, and produce the following maps. So what we can do is at every XY location, we can give you a mean bulk AEM conductivity areas which are more blue are areas that are more resistive and areas that are more red are those that are more conducting and you've probably all heard of quantiles back in school you were told that you were like for instance in my case you're a 10th percentile student you're hopeless then there were other people who were told they're 50th percentile students and the really bright ones were told that look you're 90th percentile but what that really means is that there's only 10% of resistivity values over um, the 90th percentile, and there's only 10% of resistivity values less than the 10th percentile. And the P50 is known as median value. But to get an idea of how you've really done, you've got to look at a bunch of them. So if you look at the P10, the P50, and the P90 values, and where the colors are similar, like if you look over here, there's a bit of red over there, as a bit of red over there, as a bit of red over there, it means that the P10, P50, and P90 are all really bunched around conducting values. So you have a lot of confidence that the area around this particular well um, is really conducting. Similarly, if we focus in on this blue area, it, it's, it's blue in all the percentiles. So you know that you're fairly confident that it's um, going to be uh, very resistive. And so we can then use this bulk conductivity derived from the AEM, this map, uh, which basically tells us about the distribution of conductivity in the saturated zone underneath the water table and its uh, uncertainty, because there's more than one possibility at a given location. So this is the, 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 the innovative part of the entire workflow that we're trying to present to you today. So Chris and co, uh, on this axis that you see here in the figure A, on the Y axis, uh, collected information about the electrical conductivity or the EC in the bores at specific depth intervals of interest. Now, at each of those bores, we also had airborne electromagnetic soundings. And we have multiple realizations of conductivity from these soundings using the software which estimates uncertainty in those soundings. So then we were able to make, and those, and that's presented on the x-axis over here. So this funny sim symbol sigma, that stands for the airborne electromagnetic conductivity. Uh, that's the bulk conductivity that's been sensed by the aircraft and then put through this process of inversion. So using the data collected in the wells on the y-axis, using the inverted conductivities uh, that have been sensed by the aircraft on the x-axis, we were able to make the scatter plot. And that's the given scatter plot. And in technical terms, it's known as a joint 
probability distribution. However, you can see it's kind of scattershot. And this is one of the things about statistics that is um, a little unintuitive when you think about it, uh, but it'll make sense to you. We need to smooth these to have confidence that we haven't overinterpreted our given data. Um, so our given data is like saying on the 6th of January, on the 6th of December, on the 13th of March, and on the 5th of February, we're going to have sunshine in Canberra. Now, that's a very specific statement. However, it's probably safer and more accurate to say that we know that in Canberra, we're going to get six months of sunshine at the very least. So you're, you have more confidence in a statement that you've smoothed out a little more. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing over here. So we've used some smoothing to have some confidence in the relationship we're building between bulk conductivity on the um, x-axis and the uh, electrical conductivity that Chris and co have sampled in the field. And then what we're going to do is go to areas where we don't have um, uh, Chris and, and his team uh, sweating it out and collecting samples. We're, we're just going to use the values of bulk conductivity as sensed by the aircraft. And using this relationship, we're going to then try and say something about the electrical conductivity, which can be translated into salinity using the relationship that um, uh, Chris showed you on the previous few slides. But it's very important to validate. So what we did is we left two boreholes, 635734 and 635739, out of our analysis. And then we found the uncertainties from the airborne electromagnetics on the resulting electrical conductivity um, that this relationship in B has helped us build. And then we see histograms relating to that uncertainty uh, orange corresponding to 63574, blue corresponding to 635739. And then you can see that the orange histogram, which is a prediction of the probability of electrical conductivity, though we haven't measured it there. Um, well, at least our algorithm doesn't know we've measured it there, but we actually did. We just left it out of the analysis because we wanted to validate. And what you see is that the measurement that Chris and Co. did at 635734 falls in a high probability area of the orange histogram. Same with 635739. It falls in a high probability area of the blue histogram. So what this means is that we can have confidence that um, where we haven't measured the electrical conductivity in the Earth, we can use the bulk airborne electromagnetic conductivity to predict with some accuracy and we can also tell you it's uncertainty what the electrical conductivity in the Earth should be. And all of that is great, but it needs to be translated into something which is human usable. And so for that, roughly based on the Australia and New Zealand guidelines, uh, we were able to divide um, the electrical conductivities into four classes for human use, for agricultural use, for stock water or process use, or it might just be very saline. And again, these classes are not cast in stone. It'll depend on what the hydrologists in the area think is appropriate in consultation with the stakeholders, in consultation with the land and water use managers. We can just put that into our algorithm, just like you set different times on your alarm clock. It'll, it'll wake you up at different times of the day, but you've got to set a sensible time. So it's a similar thing over here. These classes are, are flexible but they're roughly based on uh, guidelines that uh, we found um, in the ANZEC and ARMCON's uh, recommendations. And I'd like you to note that the two uh, boreholes that we withheld from our analysis but we wanted to use for validation fall within class not one, not two, but class three. So when we make maps of our various classes of um, uh, electrical conductivity, which are translated into salinity, which are translated into these different classes for various purposes, we would expect that boreholes 5734 and 5739 fall into areas that are largely class 3. And, and that, that, that'll tell us that our uh, assessment is, is consistent. So here we are with the classification of groundwater use. And we've got four classes going from left to right. Uh, the first one is, again, for human consumption. The second is for agricultural use, and so on and so forth. Immediately, it strikes you that 
the majority of the probability lies in two classes. That's class one for human consumption, uh, because these darker colors here correspond to higher probabilities. So this, this thing which looks suspiciously to me like a smiley face, though you know that's just how it has been created in nature. It's, it's not us who put that smiley face there. Um, but that's actually good because that, that smiley face is corresponding to um, human use. So there, there seems to be very resistive and um, um, you know areas that are suitable for, um, which have low conductivity, low salinity, and therefore suitable for human consumption. Um, then you've got this class, which is primarily for agricultural use, depending on the type of crop. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of prob high probabilities for that kind of use in this area. Um, there does seem to be quite a lot of uh, water which can be used for this purpose over here. And then right in the northeast, there's a high probability of there being a saline intrusion. And we know that that you know, makes sense because you're close to um, Sandy Creek and the Keep River estuary over there. And this is a lot of information to digest, but this is very useful for making decisions under uncertainty. If I wanted to put the land and water here to a particular use, then this may help me um, you know, make my decisions. And since it's a lot of information, we've tried to summarize it in telling um, the people that might use this information in, in this summary map that um, blue is good and red is bad. And these are the areas where blue wins where you've got a lot of blue, and those are the areas where red wins, and it's most probable. And this is a summary map. Um, and again, blue is good uh, for human purposes, and red is bad um, from, from that point of view in terms of salinity in groundwater. And I will now leave you with Chris to discuss some of the open questions that um, uh, our method has um, uh, thrown, thrown up. Thanks, Anand. Um, yeah, so I guess it's it's a very exciting new approach here. I think, and it's a it's quite quite a different approach to um, to what we've done in the past, which is really to provide an estimate, a single value estimate of what salinity might be in a particular location. Now we're providing. Uh, an estimated probability that the salinity is above or below a certain value, um, which which I think we can be more certain about than providing a single number. Um, but things things that still need to be developed, I guess, is uh, this this method was really dependent in this area on the data we were able to collect from those sonic drill holes. Uh, and their sonic drilling is quite expensive. It's it's more than twice as expensive as uh, mud rotary or air rotary drilling, which is much more conventional as a way of drilling uh, groundwater monitoring bores. So uh, if, if it were possible to employ this workflow in an area where we don't have sonic bores, where we only have uh, a small number of monitoring bores and we'll get one measurement of salinity at each of those bores, um, if that were possible, then this, this method would be applicable over a really a much larger extent of Australia. And I think that would have tremendous utility uh, for informing the way we manage land and manage water resources, particularly in agricultural areas. But that's yet to be tested. So that's, that's something that uh, we think is definitely worth exploring in the future is trying to apply this method in... Uh, a much more data poor area uh, because the Keep River Plains are almost astonishingly data rich for a for a groundwater investigation. There are probably very few catchments where we have as much data as we have here. So it's been great to be able to test this method with all of that data. Uh, and I think the next step is to try and apply it in a, an area where we have less data to see if the classification still gives us what we want. Um, the next question, I guess, is, is how sensitive the method might be in a different landscape. As I said earlier, the range of salinity in the Keep River Plains is three orders of magnitude, uh, and the classification performed very well on differentiating very saline water from very fresh water. But um, I guess we've also yet to see if we try and apply this same method to, uh, uh, to an area where the 
salinity only varies by one or two orders of magnitude, um, how will the classification perform then? So again, I think that's that's something we definitely have the uh, the data to try and test if we can find the time, uh, and it it might really give us a good sense of how uh, how widely we can employ this technique in the future. Um, and we also don't know what the minimum density of boreholes uh, required is. So obviously it all depends on being able to relate observations from boreholes to the AEM. And if your boreholes don't intersect sort of the key end members of the conductivity spectrum in terms of the groundwater salinity, then that's always going to be a, uh, that's always going to limit the application of the technique. So again, some, some tests we could do might be um, looking at the same area and, and withholding more or less boreholes from developing that probability distribution function and seeing how well the classification performs. Um, so I guess just to conclude on all that, uh, we think this workflow is something that can help uh, with decision making around not just groundwater use, but also land management, because it's, as I described earlier, um, the dry land and irrigation salinity problems are not necessarily about uh, pumping groundwater out of the ground, but also about how much water we allow to go into the ground. Um, this, I think we've got a very good case here to show that AEM is, is going to be a useful tool for filling in the space between boreholes, uh, which is good. It allows us to do a, a more um, sophisticated, have a more sophisticated approach than an interpolation between points. Uh, and the, I guess the key thing we've done here is to give a spatial assessment of what groundwater quality is, uh, and we can give a... Uh, an estimate of, of what the likely groundwater quality in any area is. So applications for that are um, if people are, are citing potential new uh, water supply bores, then we could use this technique to assess where is it highly likely that the groundwater will be fresh. That's a good place to go and drill. Um, or where is it very likely the groundwater will be saline? And those areas are areas that we probably need to be quite careful about future issues like dry land salinity uh, or irrigation salinity. And then did you want to add anything to either of those? No, I think that was a great uh, summary. Okay, well, I guess, I guess we're done in that case. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, everyone in the East Kimberley project. They, I think all of you have contributed to this work in some way. In particular, I'd like to to recognize the support from Donna Cathro and Steve Hostetler in, um, in making it possible to complete that project. <clears throat> um, Christian Thun and all of the lab staff uh, for the work they did in the core shed up in Kananara, it was a huge effort and this certainly would have been, wouldn't have been possible without them. We also had a lot of support from field and engineering services, everyone down there, uh, I think, we couldn't have, have had our field campaign without their support, so thank you to all of them. Uh, Chris Evenden made some wonderful figures for us. Uh, Marina Costello, Stan Buchanan, Baskaran, and Carol all gave great feedback on the, uh, the original manuscript this was based on, and Rebecca Muthan and David Robinson for encouraging the presentation. Have I missed anyone? Uh, Richard Blewett. Uh, I updated the slides as of last night, <laughs> but uh, it, it seems that uh, SharePoint doesn't work nicely all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, look, uh, thank you, Chris and Anand, for a fantastic talk. We're right on time. Um, and there's a few questions down in the chat, but what I might do is I'll take one and I'll take the first one that came in and then maybe we can have a look at answering the other two offline later. So the question that's come in for the two of you is regarding the smoothing of the EC predictions. How do you decide how to smooth it? It looks like that choice will substantially affect the model uncertainty. Um, I, I can take that one, Chris, if that's okay with you. Please. 
Sure. So um, that is a very good question. And um, one of the things, and I'll, I'll, st I'll stop trying to lecture, but I, I almost have to hold myself back at this point, is that, you know, we're always data poor in the earth sciences. I used to work in oil and gas, and we were still data poor, despite the fact that there was a lot of money available to drill lots of wells. So we have to make a choice, as Chris mentioned, about the amount of data to withhold. So what we did was we withheld some data and tried to see what our prediction would do at those areas. And that's the basis on which we decided the width of the filter with which to smooth that PDF. Now, what we should also have done is we should have kept a final sanity checking test set aside to see how we've done, but we just didn't have the data. But it wasn't a completely arbitrary choice because what we wanted to do was see that the width of our filter that we used to smooth that PDF, did it hold up when we were validating? So the, the validation exercise really helped us decide the width of that filter. Okay, thank you, Anand. Look, we, we are out of time. I, I've taken a note of the other two questions and I'll shoot them over to uh, both of you. And otherwise, I'd like to thank you again for your presentation and thank the audience for joining us.